Well, good morning and welcome everyone to the session on Australia's accelerating green energy transition. Uh, I hope everyone uh, can uh, hear and see everything okay at the moment. And uh, I'd like to now uh, just start off uh, by uh, acknowledging the uh, traditional owners on the lands where the ANU resides, that is the Ngunnawal people, and also the traditional owners on the land on which uh, you are joining us at this meeting. Uh, my name is Professor Ken Baldwin. I am Director of the ANU Grand Challenge Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific. And it's my pleasure today to be chairing this session uh, where we'll look at Australia's accelerating green energy transition and the implications that has for the economy and society over the coming years. Uh, the program today is uh, that we will be, uh, first of all, starting with a panel discussion with our panellists, uh, followed by some questions amongst the panel. Uh, I'd also like to welcome any members of the media that have joined us today and to remind you that if you'd like to join the discussion on Twitter, then please use hashtag ACL forum as the handle. So now I'd like to introduce our panel and uh, let me start with uh, the uh, first of our, our speakers today, Leanne Bond. Uh, Leanne has a background in engineering and is uh, interested in the transition to low carbon energy sources. Uh, she's an independent non-executive chair of Mining3 and a non-executive director of Snowy Hydro, Clean Energy Finance Corporation, Oricon Group, Cinetech Corporation and the Quado Group. Uh, she's also engaged with the ANU in the Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program and is on the advisory board of the Master of Sustainable Energy at the University of Queensland. So welcome Leanne. Uh, next, we have Deepmar Turbio. Deepmar is Science Director at CSIRO, uh, where he uh, heads the Energy Business Unit. Uh, and he has working uh, with him a team of scientists, engineers, economists, and business professionals in a multidisciplinary team that is looking at the challenges of the energy transition. Uh, prior to this, Deepmar was the Director of the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute, or ASTRI. And then finally, uh, our panel uh, member uh, from uh, Pollination, Martin Wilder. He is the founding director of Pollination, which is a global climate advisory and investment firm uh, that's focused on developing innovative policies, ideas and investments that enable our economies to rapidly transition to net zero whilst preserving natural ecosystems. Uh, so Martin uh, has uh, uh, a, a, a background uh, in the sector, uh, particularly uh, in his association uh, with the ANU, where he's adjunct professor of international climate change law. Uh, and he's also a member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. So uh, welcome, Martin. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is to offer each of our panelists the opportunity to uh, speak for a few minutes on some of the key issues that they see in accelerating the green energy transition. And uh, we will then follow that with uh, some questions amongst panel members. So that after that, uh, please get ready to uh, put your own questions, which you can do, as I said before, by using the raise hand function in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, so now what I'd like to do is to invite Leanne Bond to give us her perspective on what she believes to be the important aspects of the energy transition. Over to you, Leanne. Um, thank you, Ken. Um, I'm coming to you here from Brisbane, which is the Yagara and Turbul people and acknowledge um, the oldest past, present and emerging. Um, I, as you've heard with my portfolio, enjoy a lot of different perspectives on this, this topic. Um, I'm an engineer, a chemical engineer by background and started in the oil and gas industry, the energy industry, and have really moved with this emerging topic. Um, the first time I came across 
um, the, the concept of climate change was, um, I was doing some environmental management study um, probably in the 90s. And to be honest, I just thought it'll all be done. You know, there's low hanging fruit. We'll work this through. Um, I had seen um, the hole in the ozone layer in the 80s be closed because we banned CFCs. And I just thought that would happen. And I suppose I was a bit surprised later, years later, when I came back to the topic that we hadn't really done even energy efficiency. Um, so it's interesting now that we're really focusing on technology as an engineer. I do think we can solve problems. Um, so I'm intersecting with it, I suppose, through research, education, policy, technology and investment which gives me a very interesting perspective on, on different ways of looking at this. All of my comments today are personal, but informed by my portfolio. Um, so I think I was really heartened to hear yesterday from Joe Evans and, and from our treasurer, um, but Joe said, you know, this is all fact, no room here for belief. And I think that's a big, a big change that has happened in the last year or two. Um, I think people do accept that there is an issue and anyone that saw the um, IPCC report presentation yesterday would understand. Um, so what needs to happen? Well, if I just describe very briefly some of the things I'm involved in. Um, so ARENA and CFC obviously um, drove a lot of um, funding in the early days for renewables um, and continue to do that, but now I'm, moving on to strengthening the grid, um, supporting transmission and decarbonising other sectors, property, transfer, transport, agriculture, um, looking to how do we bring in electric vehicles and hydrogen. So a lot of these things, um, it's a financing challenge. Um, in the beginning, solar and wind, the business um, payback wasn't clear. So there was a role there. Now banks are more able to fund, but a lot of the emerging um, solutions don't yet have markets and hydrogen. There was a comment yesterday about the supply chain for hydrogen. It just doesn't exist yet, so it needs to be built. Um, Snowy is obviously heavily involved in also firming um, the NEM through building the Snowy 2.0 project, uh, additional pump storage, and already plays that role with its current portfolio. Um, supporting the NEM um, when it needs needs um, firming. We're also um, building the Hunter Power project for gas peaking to fill that gap as well. Um, Oricon and Synetic are probably looking at it from an internal perspective, but also um, how to assist clients. Everyone, all of the listed companies are now realising that they need for their investors um, and their staff to make commitments to transitioning and also for their risk profile. Um, so there's a, a big role there in both developing solutions and applying existing solutions, but also um, developing new technologies. Um, in my role as chair of Mining3, we spend a lot of time thinking about sustainability of the mining industry and how to have a, a smaller footprint, but also be there to develop the critical minerals that we will need um, for this. And you know, through the University of Queensland, we're training the next generation of people who are gonna solve these problems. So the Master of Sustainable Energy takes people who are already in an industry of, of some sort um, and gives them the skills and the, the thinking that they need to be able to engage with this topic and solve some of these problems. Um, and the battery storage grid in integration um, project is more into the, the deep research that we need. So I, I really get that there's a lot of different things we have to do, not just one thing. And um, I think really the people who first caught on to the need to, to reimagine our energy um, and our carbon footprint was really insurers now. Uh, investors, um, staff, customers, everyone is engaged in this topic. So I think I might leave it there. Um, there's, there's definitely 
uh, and a, uh, a pace at which people are engaging with this topic and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Terrific, thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, now I'd like to call on Dietmar Tullier to say a few words on the topic. Thank you, Dietmar. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm calling in from. I'm on the Monaghan Peninsula, south of Melbourne. And um, the traditional owners are the Boon people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not Australian, I'm German and I moved to Australia three years ago. Um, and before I joined here, I actually had 20 years at GE developing technology in the energy space. So I'm very happy to see that Australia is choosing a technology path. Um, and as you can imagine, the CSIRO, we're right in the, in the middle of that. Um, a lot of what Leanne just said earlier resonated with what I'd like to say. The, the transition that the whole world is going through, not just Australia, towards net zero uh, emission energy is a large undertaking. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's not a one size fits all and one, one um, silver bullet will solve the, the problems or the challenges that we have. But let's not call them problems. So at CSRO, we're, we're looking at this at multiple areas that are connected, but um, often um, discussed in isolation. And what we hear often about, uh, talked about is the electricity transition. And I think most of what we've heard um, recently, uh, yesterday as well, and, and what we are hearing today is focusing around how do we change the electricity sector towards net zero. And we shouldn't forget that the electricity sector is just a part of what, um, what the energy overall energy segment is. So at CSIRO, we're looking at the electricity transition, of course, but we're also looking at transport transition and the industry transition. Um, and, and, and what is the shift that needs to be done in terms of technology development to get us through that transition? And one of the things I keep reminding people of is that the transition of the industry and also the transport will have an effect on electricity. If all the energy we're providing to our industry and also to transport is either electric or through hydrogen or through alternative fuels, ultimately it boils down, boils down to having more electricity that's needed. And I think can our discussion today will go in that direction. So in order to accelerate that, um, the, the scale of the transition is going to become an important issue that, um, that needs to be addressed. And the, 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 the fourth area, which for Australia is one of the uh, a big area is of course export. Today, ex uh, Australia exports a lot of energy. Most of the energy we produce, we export. How do we transition an export sector to a, a net zero um, um, energy sector? And that's, that's gonna be a, a, the, the vast, um, the largest challenge that, that Australia is going to have and that we need to focus on. And not to forget, we do have a fifth area and that is the environment and the community engagement. So what, whatever technology solution we come up with, uh, whatever technology uh, solution we finance, we, uh, we, we put into the system, we shouldn't forget to bring the community along. And for me, that is one of the challenges also we see in Australia. And it's not only land use of PV systems, but it's also job changes. Jobs will change from fossil energy over to renewable energy. And yes, I do believe there will be more jobs uh, needed um, in, in aggregate. Uh, the jobs will be different. So we need to make sure that we don't forget our um, social sciences, which is also part of, of a science and a technology um, as well. And I do like also what Leanne said earlier, a big change to me um, growing up in Germany 20, 30 years ago, where there was a big ch challenge for the energy vendor that uh, officially was launched, uh, I think 11 years ago. Um, it was not an accepted fact yet that there is a climate change and that has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. So the world is moving to accepting it as a fact that we do have to change. And another big change is the uh, cost of photovoltaics, for example. I started working in photovoltaics in the 80s, and I think they were a, a factor of 200 or 300 more expensive than today. And everybody was saying they will never get below, um, before, below fossil fuels. And look where we are today. And I think we're not, we haven't hit bottom yet. There's still a long way to go. And that's where I think from, from CSRO, where technology development is still critical for us. Um, can, can we solve the challenges today with technology? Yes, we can. We have the technologies available to make that transition. Uh, it'll take time to get us there and it'll cost a lot of money. 
So we shouldn't forget the economic factor here. And that's where new technology is going to be needed to get uh, a more economical solution um, for this transition. So as Leanne was saying earlier, um, there's a lot of things that need to be done. It's not a, a one thing that needs to be resolved. So at CSRO, we do work on various different technology um, challenges, mostly driven to getting better efficiencies, getting lower costs. And that goes across the spectrum from new PV cells to uh, better hydrogen production, better hydrogen storage, better hydrogen transport, uh, hydrogen carriers. Uh, but it also goes to uh, cleaner fossil fuels. Because one of the things I do want to bring up, this transition is not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over a couple of decades. So there's going to be a phase out of our fossil fuels. It's not going to be stopping fossil fuels. So we need to find also ways to, um, to help that through that phase of the transition for our fossil fuel uh, to be cleaner. And that does include, in my, in my opinion, things like carbon capture and storage as well. It may be a transition solution, but that transition takes a while. So it's not a, a short or very short term solution. Um, and the other thing is we need to remember that this is not a green field. And I think that goes along with that phase out. We're not starting from scratch. We do have an energy system today. And the big challenge for us in Australia is going to be to take where we are today and move that as quickly as possible to the end state that we're all striving for. And that transition will impact a lot of people's lives, a lot of people's jobs, because it's going to take a couple of decades. Um, and so that is what, in, in my opinion, is the, the, the largest challenge that we have here. All right, Ken, I'll leave it at that uh, and I'll pass it back to you. Terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Deepa. Uh, so now I'd like to call on Martin Wilder to provide his perspective on the, the transition. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thanks very much, Ken. And um, I think, like Leanne, um, I come from a broad background, both looking at this at the moment from an investment perspective, uh, both here and overseas, and also for many years chaired Low Carbon Australia, which was the precursor to CFC, I was on the board of that and then chaired Arena for quite some time. So um, we've seen over that period a, a rapid change. I guess I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things that have partly been brought up, but just from a, a slightly so a, a different perspective. So the first is, is around technology. So we often talk about the technology being now, I think in Australia, um, we often get to see a lot of the international technology last. So there's a lot of um, things that are emerging all the time um, around the world on energy transition technology. Um, we are probably at the moment seeing five to 10 incredible innovations a week of which probably 70% will never work, but 30% are actually leapfrogging ahead of what is going on. So I think one of the interesting thing there is just the speed at which the technology is moving. Um, I think one of the real challenges with that technology though is integration and how do you integrate that into an existing and evolving system and also the issue of risk mitigation. So when you're looking at a new technology and incorporating that into an existing facility um, or, or into a new process, how do you actually, who, who bears the risk of that? And that has been one of the barriers which we've seen to date. And that's a, a role that the government can probably pay, play more, more, more of a role in. Um, secondly, I think this is all about systems change. It's not just about the change of, of putting in a new wind farm or putting in a new solar farm or a new battery system. This is about, we have to look at this through the entire system being transformed. And a lot of the work I think that's going on in Europe at the moment is about how do you actually move an entire car manufacturing system away from, from petrol to, to, to electric. And when you look at what's happening with the the number of battery gigafactories in Europe that have emerged in the last 12 months, the rate of change is phenomenal. And so when we look at this issue, we have to look at it at a, at a more at a broader level, which is everything from, from as Leanne, Leanne was talking about, the minerals that we take out of the ground, all the way through to through creating the technologies, all the way through to recycling uh, what comes out the other end, wind farms and, and, and solar panels, et cetera. And so that that is a whole of economic change. It's a whole, it's about building new manufacturing sectors. It's about doing all of that. And it's really important that we look at this energy transition through more of a systemic um, uh, view. Uh, the, the next point is when we look at a lot of industrial decarbonisation, that's also an area that is that is challenging. And I think people often think, oh, well, we'll just tell, you know, an aluminium smelter to change. But when you look at what happened with Portland, there are multiple parties involved in changing or, or, or in transitioning a large energy user there. 
And rather than just having the status quo, it actually requires everybody working together. So it requires government, the plant owners, the workforce, the technology providers, the alternatives to come up and think together in a package. And it's like doing a large sort of project in effect. It's not, you can't just anticipate that a time ago or somebody else will just change. It actually requires a team of people uh, within the ecosystem to actually work through how that is going to happen over a long period. And then again, coming back to this issue of, of how you ma manage the, the transition risk. Um, another key point then is also the issue around finance. So I think at the moment, there is a huge amount of money that's in the system, private money being being pushed towards technology um, and towards this energy transition. But one of the challenges is the very large super funds really are wanting to write checks of up to a billion to two to three billion dollars for a lot of the investments they make. And a lot of the, the a lot of the um, energy um, technologies we see are actually require much smaller funding. So one of the challenges is how do you actually fund the ideas that need to come through the system? And I think that there's a tremendous amount of, of money for um, for, well, there's, there's money for VC emerging, there's quite a lot for PE, and there's a lot of super fund money, but there's a very limited amount of money to actually develop the transition changes that we need. Um, and I think that's an area where, and this is even pre-arena sort of type funding, this is very early stage. And at the moment, we've probably seen a lot of the, the large investors and the institutional investors starting to come further down the chain. So they're coming from large scale investing to PE. But this idea of needing to fund the development of ideas and how to transition economies, which is a role that people like the CSRO and universities and, and others can take and, and government itself, that, that is where the big gap is at the moment. And so we're seeing that more overseas than in Australia, but we actually need to have more of that focus on how do we actually work out how we're going to transition an entire sector and rebuild manufacturing, for example, in Australia. So when the state government of New South Wales says we want 8,000 electric buses, the thinking should be, okay, well, rather than just buying those buses from overseas, how do we actually, from the ground up, build an entire sector that's based on renewable energy to really to include bus manufacturing and drive that at scale very fast and then make that an export industry. Um, the, the, the other point I just wanted to make was also around, um, around what, what are some of the other drivers here. So, so there are two. One is, is the legal driver. Um, there are currently 18 pieces of litigation going on in Australia against against um, major banks and other investors for investing in fossil fuels. Whether or not you agree with that those, that litigation, one of the impacts that it's having is many of the banks, the financial institutions are no longer gonna fund, I guess, fossil fuels are already withdrawing from that. They're already a bit scared to fund gas. And so the cost of capital and the availability of capital is fundamentally shifting. Um, and it's happening at speed and it's happening very quickly. And I think, the change that you've seen over the last six months is quite dramatic, but the but the challenge with this is that this litigation does have an impact on timing, on investing, and on the willingness of investors to put money into various areas. So, as Leanne and Dipmo were talking about shareholders, I mean we are seeing th this pressure really play out in the finance sector, and I think um, people probably underestimate that. Um, and then finally, the other issue is geopolitics. So. As we see a lot of the, as we see China pushing more into getting rare earths and, and other minerals from areas like, um, like Africa, a lot of talk about them trying to access it from Afghanistan. What opportunities are there for Australia in the shifting geopolitics in terms of, of taking our, our, our base of rare earths and our base of, of, of other minerals to be using those and, and strategically positioning ourselves at, 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 in this sort of change in geopolitics? I think there's huge opportunity for Australia across the entire value chain of energy, all the way from digging up minerals, all the way through to recycling. And we need to look at it in a more holistic way. And I think that's where the massive opportunity for us sits. And you know, a key player in that is transmission. And then the final point I'll just make is that um, a lot of this is difficult. A lot of this hasn't been done before. I think people often think that this is easy and some of the technologies that we're talking through, even you know, how do you integrate solar on your roof to cars to putting back into the grid is pretty straightforward. But it's something that even um, that is still evolving. So a lot of things that I think we sometimes take for granted that are easy to do are still have to be done. But it's, I think there's a huge opportunity for us and, and, um, and we just have to make sure that we play it properly. Terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, so now that we've uh, heard from all three panellists today, uh, we'll now just have a, a quick uh, discussion amongst the group and, uh, and invite you uh, while we're doing that to think of questions that you might wish to ask the panel. 
Uh, and you can then do that by using the raise hand function on the tab at the bottom of your screen. So one of the things I think that's not widely recognised uh, by uh, not only people uh, overseas, but people in Australia is that uh, despite the fact that uh, we've had, uh, you know, essentially policy chaos in this country over the last decade or more in the, in the climate and energy space, uh, that Australia is actually now leading the world in the transition of the electricity sector. We're installing solar and wind generating capacity at a faster rate per person than any other country. In fact, 10 times faster than the world average. So our electricity sector is leading the charge, if you like, internationally in terms of the transition that is, is uh, being undertaken. And this by and large is driven mainly by the sheer economics of the price structure for solar and wind. And as Steve Myers mentioned, the cost of solar panels now is factors of several hundred uh, less than it was back in the 80s. And it's very hard to imagine any other uh, technology that is, has undergone such a rapid reduction. Uh, so my question to the panel is, while we're world leaders at the moment and we can see our way uh, maybe over the next couple of years to reaching 50% of renewable electricity by the mid 2020s or approaching 100% in the 2030s perhaps, what are the what are the bottlenecks? What are the barriers that might get in the way of this happening? As Leanne said earlier, she thought uh, back in the day when uh, the ozone layer had been closed that uh, the same could be done for for climate change and global warming. Well, uh, we're now moving rapidly down the path in terms of the adoption uh, of renewables by the private sector. What can get in the way of completing this process and extending this to other sectors? I'd like to hear the, the panel's views on that. Leanne, would you like to say something? Just unmuting. Um, yes, um, so there's lots of things that could get in the way, but I think the, the reference to the system and, and you know, the system we are built on for our electricity sector was designed in a very different way. And I think um, initially a lot of engineers were saying well this can't be done but now it is happening and so now it's how do we do it and I think there's a lot of um, uh, decisions being made about how to strengthen our grid um, there are requirements for um, transmission so that we can move energy to where it's needed um, and it's the intermittent nature so there's again um, a framework that's got to be developed to allow people to invest and um, there are investments happening um, but um, for instance the snowy 2 project you know we we have the backing of government so um, i'm not sure whether a, a private company could have made that decision but um, i think those models of how do we actually present a framework for in, a private investment to carry the heavy load is one of those Yes, and, and perhaps, Martin, going back to your earlier question about unlocking investment, um, is there a, a role for government in this? I mean, what we're seeing is a, is a charge being led by and large by industry at the moment. Um, and, and as I said previously, it's, uh, it's uh, been done in the background of the policy chaos, at least uh, in the, the federal system here in Australia. So what, what is your view in terms of unlocking the investment that's needed uh, from a from a government perspective, yeah, I think I think there are there, there are probably two key things that that are required. The first is that, um, unfortunately, at the moment the states don't view energy policy or the way they approach energy as a, a, as an issue that's what's best for the system. It's more what's best for the state. So you know, one of the big issues was you know we need we need and we're now getting a you know transmission lines between different states. But for a long time, the focus was on you know in Queensland we're going to build this this energy in in, in New South Wales we're going to build this we're going to build these renewable energy zones, without necessarily too much thought as to what that means for an interconnected system. So I think the first thing we need to do is having the states work together, um, particularly where there's disagreements with the federal government. So seeing, thinking about what's 
best for for the NEM as opposed to what's just best for their state. Um, and that ultimately then means what's best for Australia, because if you're trying to build a manufacturing industry on hydrogen, for example, how do you coordinate that at a country level as opposed to just a state level? I think the other, the second key issue is risk and risk mitigation. So, you know, you need to, one of the challenges with the renewable energy zones and with some of the, the rules is that um, around the CENI rules was obviously you have the, the challenge that, you know, the, the, the generation won't come to the transmission is guaranteed, the transition won't come to the generations there. So you need to, there's been a lot of work around this, but where someone's either, you know, coming in to build new technologies, they need to know that they can, they can put it on the ground, it can be financed, and they can therefore get the finance. So the governments, you know, can play a really important role there in terms of underwriting uh, new assets into the system or underwriting the risk. And at the end of the day, the, when we did the large-scale solar funding round at Arena, everybody said that wasn't feasible, it wasn't going to be possible. We didn't have people in Australia who knew how to build those solar farms. We didn't have banks who knew how to finance them. And but going through that process, that basically de-risked the process. And um, at, at the end result was that the cost came down and you found ways to make that happen. So I think government can play, can play a very important role in short-term risk mitigation, which ultimately, I don't think there really is much risk because if it's done properly, those people will find solutions to make it work. Thank you, Martin. And Dimo, from the perspective of, of, you know, moving beyond the electricity sector, we see uh, that, you know, this is accounting for roughly a third of our emissions, uh, and uh, a similar sort of fraction of our total energy use. What about the other sectors in the economy? And as you mentioned earlier, what about the export sectors that are beckoning uh, in terms of a shift from fossil fuel exports to renewable energy exports? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one, um, Ken. Bef before you go there, I want to respond to something Leanne said about the, the need for the system um, to be strengthened. That could be a barrier. I, I want to make sure we don't forget that um, when when we do transition all the sectors simultaneously, the transport sector will require another 70 to 100 gigawatts electricity um, that we don't have today. So when we design the system um, for transmission, distribution and storage at the right spaces, we need to make sure we have the future development of the entire system in mind and not just solve the problems that we're seeing today. Um, so we need to solve the problems that will occur in the next couple of decades. Uh, so I wanna make sure that we keep that in mind. And then confounded with that, the export sector, as you mentioned, when you look at the energy flow in Australia, the export sector is about 20 times the amount of energy that we actually use domestically. Um, so there are a couple of ways to, to, so, to uh, solve that challenge. One of it is to export the same amount of energy, but as renewable energy. I don't think that's feasible. I think that it's, um, First of all, the world will probably not import that much energy when it's renewable energy. And second of all, it's probably not feasible for Australia to build an industry that generates 20 times the amount of energy that we have today in Australia in terms of renewable energy. Um, that's, that's just gonna be a big challenge for us to do. So another way to solve that is think about um, shifting our export products into more value added products, putting energy into products that we then export rather than exporting directly the energy. So it will, it will be a mix. We will still in the future export some energy, some form of green energy in terms of either hydrogen itself or in terms of uh, HVDC lines into Polynesia. Um, and so, so that will be part of it. But in, at the end of the day, um, for, for us to continue to export that form of energy, I think it will be important to embed that into more value added products that could be uh, that could be sub products of of um, of end solutions, for example, um, it could be uh, parts of an overall car or it could be um, uh, pre pre processed or it could be um, or pre processed any other minerals, rather than shipping the raw minerals, so the solution for us in the export sector. Um, to still continue having a big export market is to think about uh, partly exporting the clean energy, but also partly exporting green products that are produced in Australia with green energy. Yes, indeed. Good, well, I think uh, we might now uh, wrap up the session. Uh, we're getting close to the closing time. Uh, so, I think we've had a very good discussion here about Australia's energy transition. 
and uh, some of the challenges and, and some of the opportunities as well that, uh, that we face. And uh, I think that, you know, one of the key points that has come out of this is that there are not only many things that need to be done, but there are also many players and many drivers that uh, will make this happen. Uh, it's not just up to uh, one, uh, one sector of the, the, the community or, or one uh, sector of the economy that uh, will make this uh, transition work. It, it's really a, across the entire range. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, just wrap up by uh, thanking our panelists again. Uh, thank you uh, to Leanne Bond. Thank you to Martin Wilder and thank you to Dietmar Tubier for providing their insightful perspectives today. Uh, thank you uh, again to the audience uh, for your participation and your questions. Uh, we uh, keep an eye on the chat function. So if you have other questions that we haven't answered, uh, perhaps we can uh, answer those online for you. Uh, and uh, we uh, again, uh, thank the Crawford uh, Leadership Forum for the opportunity to uh, talk about these really important issues with you here this morning. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, subsequent events. Thank you very much.